This work is based on joint work with uh, Benny Pinkas and Thomas Schneider, as just mentioned, and it, um, it, re it resulted from us wanting to have a look how far we came with private Saturn section, what is the current state of the art, and whether we could actually like deploy it in a real world scenario. So I'm just gonna present you some findings and um, show you some techniques that we did to optimize the work further on. So first off, let's have a look at private set intersection. Um, other than the two previous talks, we're not focusing on correctness here. So what we actually want to have is privacy. We have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they both have their input sets and want to obtain the intersection of their input sets without leaking any information about their inputs. So in particular, they can't just go ahead and disclose their inputs to each other because um, these inputs may actually be highly privacy, uh, um, explicit, yeah, highly private. So um, there actually are a lot of applications out there as well as have been tackled in research. The first very natural one is secure database join where you have two companies which want to combine their databases of customers to um, increase their, their service to the customers without leaking which customers they have. On the other side, you have something like common contacts where you have two, uh, two people who want to find out who they know. Um, and there are completely different things where you wouldn't have expected that private center intersection is needed, such as botnet detection, uh, tutor detection, online games, testing human genomes or relationship path discovery in social networks. So I hope you get the point that this is actually needed out there or has applications out there. And um, so if you're a developer or if you want to tackle this program, what you would actually or what would come in mind first is the following protocol. So let's say Alice holds input um, labeled with X while Bob holds the inputs labeled with Y. And what you would first do is you have both parties hash their inputs. Then in the second step, you have Bob send the inputs over to Alice, who then simply compares um, the hashes in order to get the result. Um, note that I'm assuming that Alice is the one who gets the output here. She can simply send the output back to Bob if that is required and so on. So if we look at this protocol, which is actually deployed out there, um, which we've seen multiple times because this is like really, really efficient. You only need to do a hash function evaluation, evaluation per element and you only have to have Bob send a hash over for each element. Also, you can pre-compute the solution which makes it really efficient. Um, on the downside, actually, if you have only very small elements, say telephone numbers, names, even email addresses, this can leak privacy about Bob's input because Alice can just go ahead and brute force or computer hashes for all, ele all possible elements and then ju just compare the hashes and thereby she can obtain the inputs of Bob. So um, this protocol you can actually only use if the, if the element space is sufficiently large, say if you're comparing documents and so on. Um, so, what we did in our paper, or what, uh, were our, what our contributions of our paper were, um, is that we summarized or did a survey on the major results in the field of private set intersection. When we looked at these results, we found some, some way to optimize some of them using current state-of-the-art techniques. Then we, we used these insights again to develop a new protocol, and finally we compared their performance in order to to gain insights on which protocol we actually want to use in which scenario and um, how far we've actually gotten from, from when it all started with private set intersection. Um, so let's review the things that have happened in this area. Basically the first protocols have started out using public key cryptography. The first one actually dates back as far as 86, um, which we found quite by coincidence because it was made, mentioned in an appendix somewhere in a paper saying like, well, if you don't have a trusted third party or something, you might follow this protocol. And it was, it was outlined pretty sketchy and so on. And um, it requires a linear number of public key operations in the number of elements. The second protocol is quite a recent one by uh, the Christopher and Zudek, 
requires around the same overhead. Then um, we have like another line of research that spawned some years ago, which uses generic secure computation. And as we've heard in the, in the past talk in generic secure computation, what you do is you take a function, you express it as Boolean circuit, and then use standard techniques such as Yao's garbled circuits or GMW to evaluate this function securely. And thereby you can evaluate any function that you can express as a Boolean circuit. And the most prominent or the, the state of the art work or function description for private set intersection was given in NDSS 2012 um, and requires n log n symmetric crypto. Um, I forgot to mention n is the number of elements in the set. So a logarithmic factor in overhead in symmetric crypto. Then we've seen quite a recent trend where a protocol or where protocols spawn that use oblivious transfer directly to perform set intersection. And I'll tell you just next slide what oblivious transfer is, but keep in mind that we can do this very, very efficiently. There are a lot of works out there that do oblivious transfers using only very little symmetric cryptographic operations. And this protocol, or the most prominent of these protocols, was the Bloom filter based protocol at CCS 2013, which requires a linear number of uh, symmetric cryptographic operations. So, just to briefly recap what an oblivious transfer is. Um, there you have, again, two parties, Alice and Bob. Bob holds two strings, S0 and S1, and Alice wants to obtain one of these strings. And the output is such that Bob learns the strings, which he, which he queried for, while not learning any information about the other string. And Bob does not learn any information about which string Alice actually chose in the end. Um, I'm just gonna briefly go over our optimizations of existing protocols. So first, um, the, the generic secure computation protocol, we did a little bit of optimization and uh, it came down to a performance increase of factor two in communication and computation. And the tricks we did actually also had applications to, or can also be applied to other functionalities. Uh, second, for the garbled bloom filter protocol that is based on oblivious transfer, we randomized the whole process and thereby got a computation increase of factor three and a communication increase of factor four again, only using state-of-the-art techniques that are out there and by tweaking certain parts. Um, next, I'm gonna show you the protocol that we actually developed throughout the study then. And I'm gonna do this using in three steps kind of. I'm gonna start by explaining the basic functionality, so taking an input X and an input Y, you want to test for equality. Then I'm gonna extend that to kind of a set inclusion approach where you want to check whether one element is in a set of elements. And finally, I'm gonna show you how to do the intersection between two sets. So starting with the uh, equality test, um, in a basic, as a basic example, we assume that a, uh, X held by Alice is 001 and Y held by Bob is 011. So what Bob does is he generates two random strings which I depict in green and a bit lighter greenish. And then both parties perform an oblivious transfer where Alice chooses the string which corresponds to the first bit of her value. So it's the first bit of X. Alice then receives the string and the parties perform the same again and again for each bit in their elements. Um, then as a next step, Bob XORs the strings that corresponds to the bit, bits in Y. So he first takes the zero string of the greens, the one strings of the yellow, and the one strings of the magenta ones. Then XORs these, these together and sends them back to Alice. Alice then simply um, XORs the strings that she received in the oblivious transfers and compares. And if these strings are equal, then we know that we have a match. We can also simply extend this by, not, uh, by, by increasing the string size. So we transfer multiple elements of Y at once and instead of just um, transferring a single element. Note that the number of oblivious transfers actually remains the same. We only have to do multiple, we only have to append strings, but this doesn't cost us much. This is basically for free. 
but um, the cost overhead we receive is in the step where Bob sends the mask back to Alice because now he has to send n times um, delta bit or n masks back to Alice. And finally, extending this to private center section, we get that um, the whole protocol has to be, or there have to be n squared comparisons, which is arguably way too much if your set grows too large. So um, here we cannot apply it directly. So we use an, uh, a solution which is basically basic computer science, which you, you learn in grad school. Um, we use hashing, basically, to be hash elements into buckets and then compare the elements that are in the bucket. Um, I'll just give you a brief example. So what Alice does is she hashes each of her elements and assigns it to a bucket based on the output of the hash function. She does that for each of her elements and Bob basically does the same. So if Alice and Bob have an element in common, all they need to do is compute the intersection on the buckets and if the element is the same, the element will be in the same bucket and will be therefore in the intersection. Um, there is a vast amount of literature on this, on the theoretical side, and overall this allows us to reduce the overhead from m squared to n log n. So next I'm just basically going to give you the results of our evaluation. We did a more extensive evaluation in the paper, so see the paper for more details, where we vary the, uh, the bandwidth, the number of threads that we execute, the number of elements. But right now I'm only going to stick to to the power of 18 elements, which is around a quarter of a million of, um, with elements of 32 bits and a 128 bit security setting. Um, note that the scales of the uh, graph are in logarithmic scale to make it better visible. Um, first off, we have the naive approach or the hashing approach that I showed you in the beginning, which is basically bottom line. We want to compare against this approach because this is what is used out there practically for efficiency reasons. So this is a very good start, kind of. Next, we have the public key-based protocols, where we, um, we instantiated the Diffie-Hellman protocol of, uh, that was introduced in 86 using finite field crypto and elliptic curves. And because of the high security parameter, the elliptic curve version performs way better than the finite field version of the protocol. And what is actually quite interesting to see is that um, although this protocol was proposed in 86 and only mentioned in an appendix, it does perform better than protocols or way better than protocols that were introduced 24 years later or something. So um, this, also, this already came as quite a surprise to us. Um, next, we have the protocols that are based on generic secure computation techniques. And there we used um, the aus circuit technique on the one hand, so similar to the NDSS 2012 paper, and the GMW protocol on the other hand. And what we can see here is that Yao's Gabel Circuits protocol is better than the naive um, GMW protocol. With our optimization in the paper, um, we were able to get the communication of GMW lower than that of Yao's Gabel Circuits, but in terms of runtime, Yao's Gabel Circuits still um, is way better. But still, if you notice, these protocols are like two orders of magnitude of the public key-based protocols in terms of communication and computation also a bit worse. Um, finally, we have the oblivious transfer-based protocols. Here we can see the um, garbled room filter protocol of 2013 and our optimization of the protocol, which makes it more efficient in the end. And finally, the protocol that we introduced new, which um, even even improves upon the two protocols. So um, to sum up kind of the performance, we can see that the public key-based protocols have a higher runtime, and um, at least for large security parameters, but overall have the best communication of all the protocols that we measured. The generic or the circuit-based protocols have the highest communication. They're just off by two orders of magnitude from everything else. So. If you only want to do private center section, it's probably not for you, but um, the strength of these protocols is actually that you can adapt your functionality to anything you want. So if instead of doing intersection, you want to compute the size of the intersection, then you just add a, 
add a Boolean gate or something to the circuit and suddenly you have the size and so on. Um, finally, the OT-based protocol actually have a pretty good performance when compared to the rest, but still they're far off from what we want to achieve or what we have to compete with when we do the naive approach. Um, to sum up and to give you actually some, some takeaway messages if you want to implement private set intersection protocols, the OT-based protocols are very good for the general case. You can just use them in the general case, which is, they, they give you mo good performance in most of the scenarios. If communication is actually your bottleneck and you have a lot of computational resources, say you're running on the cloud and have a lot of machines in parallel, then probably the, um, the Fjellman-based uh, version or protocol in the elliptic curve crypto version is the protocol you want to be implementing. And finally, the circuit-based protocols aren't that good if you only want to do private set intersection, but if you want to change the functionality, then they're probably what you're looking for. And as a little goal and challenge to everybody out there, we um, envision that we want to do private set intersection on a million set elements in less than a second, just to have a, a point which we want to focus on. So that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to have your questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Murat Kantar, Jolinerist of Exit Dallas. Since we have plenty of time, I will ask a couple of. So first of all, uh, the OT-based protocol you shown looked like the sender, once received the hash message, can try possible different input bits to be able to predict that. Um, the sender does not receive any, so. So when he receives the hash value, can't he just try to try subsets? Um, you mean a this basic yes. protocol? The sender does not receive any of the masks. Only Alice, or the sender in this case, Bob, does not receive any of the masks. The only person who receives the masks is Alice. So Bob does not know which one he receives, and Alice, on the other hand, does not know um, which other masks there were. So if Bob chooses a different one, because they're all independent and random, Alice can't, can't guess which one, in which position he chose differently. Can he try? Can she try? The she can try, but um, it's basically information theoretic. So if you have 40 random bits, then you have to guess 40 random bits, and it's still, it doesn't give you anything, kind of. Uh, maybe I misunderstood this one, uh, anyway. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, can the hash, is Thing, optimization you have done cannot be applied to the uh, elliptic curve based ones so this hash optimization can um, be applied there that wouldn't give us in this case any benefits because hashing actually adds an additional overhead okay. um, if you do hashing you have to do a n log n overhead right. I'll just jump there Oops. you have to do the n log n overhead versus in the elliptic curve protocol you only do n operations from the start. So you would actually be adding overhead. And then my last one is the, uh, I was uh, in the NDSS 2012 presentation <laughs> and their claim was that uh, we are much faster than the uh, pri uh, public key crypto, if I wasn't mistaken. So yeah. what, what, I mean, what's the, why <laughs> the difference <laughs> in the conclusion? That is, that is actually a really good um, question. and. There has actually been some follow-up work by uh, De Christopher and Sudik, so I'm just basically going to summarize this uh, for everybody. Yeah, the two protocols we have here, the um, HEK12 and the blind RSA protocol. Um, in NDSS, the HEK12 protocol compared its performance to the blind RSA protocol, and they found that for huge security parameters, they were a lot better than this protocol. Um, the thing is, they did not optimize their implementation too much of the, of the blind RSA protocol, so the author of the blind RSA protocol did a follow-up paper which actually showed that, um, that his protocol is better than the generic secure computation one. So there's been a bit of back and forth between the two, and we tried to actually, or this was 
some of the points that spawned our work and we tried to get a final answer on when which of the two is better. Hi, uh, Emily Gretz with the University of Michigan. Um, obviously, Alice could, uh, uh, if, if she wanted to ask about a specific thing to see if it's in Bob's set, she could use the, do the protocol once to see, see if it matches with something in his set, even if it's not yeah. in hers. And I'm wondering if that would be an issue or if you'd want to somehow have some sort of confirmation that if she can find out if it's in Bob's set, Bob can also find out that she was asking about it. Mm -hmm. um, that is indeed true. That is one of the, or let's say it this way, it, it depends on the application whether this is an issue or not. Um, in our paper, we do not actually tackle this pro problem, but you have applications where you need to, to ask a party to actually sign that you own an element. So you can't just go ahead and say that you have the actual element and then input it. So you can use these protocols to adapt it to that setting, but we do not, um, we do not address it in our paper. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker and let's thank all the speakers in the session.